it seems like the breakout sessions went really, really well. It seems like there's a lot of exciting, passionate conversations about all sorts of stuff. So hopefully people have come back with a lot of ideas and energy and things to say as we kind of try to wrap up um, this year's summit and try to bring it to some sort of logical conclusion. Ha uh ha. -huh. So as we've talked about earlier, let me just review what we're trying to accomplish here in this final session. What we really want to do, first of all, I think we all want to be honest with ourselves, at least on a staff level, and recognize it's been three long days of talking and debating and organizing, and we did a rock show. So what we want to do is make sure that we ended this thing, uh, hopefully with some energy and some enthusiasm and some optimism and excitement going forward. We asked for... Uh, of the artists who we've brought down to the New Orleans retreats have been part of discussions and panels today to join us uh, here on stage. And then, does anybody want to guess how many unique visitors we had on the web feed yesterday? Anybody want to throw out a number? Yes. Just guess. Come on, this is, we're trying to participate. <laughs> one gazillion. We had one gazillion. We had 5,000 people watching the web feed. Isn't that great? And thank you to Deja and Webalicious for doing this. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to try to do three things simultaneously. We are four things, five things. We are first. We're going to start the conversation up here on the panel. We're just going to ask um, our musician friends to just see if they have anything they want to throw into the mix to get the conversation started. Again, with the idea that what we're trying to do is draw connections. So if you saw something on Monday that relates to something today that related to something last week, that's kind of what we're going for. Just you know, ideas. What's kind of coming to the fore. We are also um, going to be in the audience. We have a couple of hand mics. So this is really meant for you all to say whatever it is you need to say. Please be nice. We're very sensitive. I'm particularly sensitive. So if you have to say, like, we hate you and didn't like your conference, you can save that for later, or the evaluations are good for that. We are, um, Casey is monitoring the web feed, and we're going to be taking questions off the chat and off of uh, questions that have been emailed earlier. And we are monitoring the Twitter feeds to see if there's some constant themes that come up as well. Uh, and then Kristen's over there going to be answering, asking questions, and Jean's going to be running around. So hopefully this will be fun. We've never tried to do this way before, but we'll see how it goes. So with that introduction, does anybody want to go first? Do any of our artists want to just share a couple thoughts about what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what they've heard, what they're worried about, what they're excited about? Dinner. <laughs> Martin's thinking about his set tonight. Martin's going to be DJing tonight. Maybe he's thinking about this sequence of songs. Um, Martin, you want to go first? Sure, can you all, okay, you can all hear me. Um, thanks for coming out, thanks for sticking it out here. Um, 16 years ago I sat back there somewhere in the audience, I was a student here and saw Chuck D on stage, so it was very in inspirational. I wasn't even playing music at the time. Um, I still had my head into uh, trying to become a diplomat. And in a certain way I have, but um, on to the next part. Uh, one of the, the biggest things about this, we've talked about um, digital, 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 and I don't even think that we understand how um, digital technology is changing our lives. And the fact that most of us were born in the analog generation, you know, I was born in 1975, maybe there's people 10 years younger than me, but that was still pretty much analog. And so the rules that we make and the structures that we create for this new digital world are akin to the way that the, you know, the ex-British colonists created a structure f for democracy. And we talked about how, um, you know, with these common themes of uh, the web has to be democratic. Um, you know, the rules that we make and the structures that we create, we're going to die, and they're still either going to have to be lived under or people are going to have to restructure them. And as we embrace and digitize our lives, the same things that we've been talking, um, you know, that have been absent in the music industry, um, egalitarianism, um, there's been all these different structural problems, racism, patriarchy, we can't replicate those. As we create these new digital structures, we have to think about how flawed these other things were rather than having them pass into this new digital world. And that, you know, all the magic that is around that, that when we experience music, whether it was buying our first LP, going to our first concert, someone who's 14 is probably seeing their first concert on a webcast and downloading an MP3 or trading with a friend. So we have to figure out how to preserve the magic at the end of the day that's involved in music because, you know, <laughs> we're, at least for me, it's, it's not the money that's keeping me in this, it's the magic, you know, but I have a different connection to music than, than a lot of people out there. So that's, that's my little two cents. Thank you. Thanks, Martine. Does anybody else, Aaron, do you mind jumping in? Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, you know, just in terms of like, like getting current after the last couple of days, I mean, I, I feel as an artist, I, 
I, my head's gonna explode. I feel, <laughs> I feel it's very confusing <laughs> in a lot of ways to have, I, I've like sat in on a variety of panels in the attempt to draw lines between all of it is very, very confusing for me. So I'm interested in everything. So that's what makes my brain feel like it's gonna explode. But stepping back, um, some of the stories that I heard from other artists, that's, that's how I orient in the world, is I just look at other artists that I admire and I try to follow in their footsteps. So looking at some of the art, other artists that I've seen um, speak uh, over the last couple of days and stepping way, way back from this conference into a, a, way, a bigger picture, um, uh, one of the things I'm seeing is that the, the new DIY is the old DIY. That's, that's how I feel. Um, and that's always been about finding the right place to put your energy, um, having a lot of integrity as you do it, and educating yourself as much as possible um, You know, in the core areas that you feel the most. And I, I think the question of what do I do with my hours as an artist, you know, and I go and explore all the little nooks and crannies of the FMC conference and my brain wants to go to all of them, but if I step back, just need to pick a few things and, and look at where my energy is best spent. And, um, you know, again, for me, I look for guidance from other artists and that. So I've been grateful for the opportunity in the last couple of days to see how a lot of other people are doing it and hopefully, you know, be an example myself as well as how I'm, I'm doing it and um, create a community that way, really. Um, the other thing I'd have to say about this conference is is that I've been, I mean, I wanted to cry at the, the FA dinner because everybody was so cool and from so many different places and that's me, I'm a, a crier. Um, <laughs> I wanted to be like, that's amazing, this person's from here and this person is that and here we are all together eating hot soup. <laughs> this is community and um, and I feel really, I feel really happy to be a part of that and um, you know, some I, I love the idea of us all coming together and throwing all this stuff out, and then here we go, we're going to spread out into the world. And yeah, pick, pick your battles and um, make sure you know what you're talking about. Uh, Nicole, or Vigier? Nicole or Jeff? Yeah, um, I was uh, just what you were saying too about the, you know, what you can do within your community as an artist. That's mostly what I, I'm taking away from this, you know, trying to figure out um, what I can do with with my music and my life other than just creating songs. And that's what, you know, FMC and air traffic control, you know, getting introduced to them. And, um, you know, I live in Asbury Park, which is in New Jersey, and they're going through a revitalization. And um, so trying to figure out how, you know, I can help out in my town with, you know, music mentorship programs. And Martine was talking about um, a program he's starting in Austin, which I found really, really interesting, the Artist Passport. Thing, um, that I think would work really great in my town too. If you if you get that up, call me. Um, but actually, I want to. Would you tell them about that? Because I think it's just a great idea. Um, I don't want to take up all the time. Uh, okay. But uh, all right, taking up time. I'll it's give you the really cool. thirty second <laughs> elevator speech. Um, and it's something that, again, kind of plugs back into the youth um, component that I thought was missing a little bit. Is that how do we cultivate audiences in the future? And um, you know we don't have to go through talking about how arts funding has been cut, and we all know that music and art is good for young people, their cognitive development. Um, and in the, at the same point, one of the things that a lot of us have experienced as cultural actors is there's all this stuff out there and still people don't go to it because there's a history of division in the country, uh, people feeling like certain places are off limits, they're for other people. And so in Austin, what I'm creating is a, an arts passport for high school students that basically takes the structures that punish them for being in the wrong place at the wrong time and reward them for being in the right place at the right time, making socially conscious choices, going to museums, uh, going to theater performances, going to concerts, and so every time they go, they get a stamp in their passport, and then a record of that trip goes to what's sort of like a cultural um, credit record. So when they're finished high school, they have this whole list of all the you know, photo exhibits they've been to, concerts, and if they want a job, an internship, if they're going to college, if they have to go to court, they have this document that they can use to outline you know, their cultural involvement in the city. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. And uh, I'm working on that right now. So. If that turns anybody on, get in touch with me and we'll talk. Thank you, Nicole. Yeah, I, that's, that, that's what I'm taking mostly out of this conference is you know, meeting people like you guys and hearing your ideas and you know, um, 
it's just very uh, empowering and inspiring to know that there's a lot more that we can do, you know, not just as musicians, but, you know, as activists for, you know, our towns and, and beyond. And um, I'm still taking in the whole copyright recording Rhapsody thing. I, I buy vinyl. So, but, um, but I would like to get paid too. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to talk about that because I'm still trying to process it all. <laughs> Uh, my name is Vijay Iyer. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm, a, I'm mostly associated with the jazz world. I'm a pianist and composer. Um, and uh, if you want to hear my music as of today, you can hear it on NPR's First Listen. Uh, that's my little hustle moment, so please, uh, if you have a chance. Um, one of my favorite musicians, Ornette Coleman, once made a distinction between the music business. Well, he, he asked, do you want to be a part of the music business or the music world? And that to me is kind of a crucial distinction. It's kind of helping me sort through all the information that it, we've all been bombarded with over the last few days because um, you know, we've heard a lot about the music business, um, you know, pro, con, uh, top down, bottom up, et cetera. And, uh, and I've, I guess I find myself, you know, I partake, I participate in the music business, but I'm more interested in music world kind of things, which is like, what, did, what is music for us? You know, how, what is, it's, it's not a product and it's not a service. It's an action taken out, carried out by people, you know, and it's, it builds community. It does things that have nothing to do with making records or selling records or digitally distributing recordings. I mean, so I, I like to kind of, I like to kind of think about, um, for example, how can we use these emerging technologies and uh, you know this huge explosion of connectivity that we have, to sort of repurpose it f towards um, aims that are more in line with the purpose of music in our lives, which uh, it isn't just about sales. I mean, we are not our playlists. You know, we are larger than that. So I like to think about how music functions at the grassroots level. Um, you know, another one of my favorite musicians, Muhal Richard Abrams, once said that uh, improvisation is a human response to necessity. And that's how I think some of my favorite music has always functioned, whether it's, you know, the invention of the drum set by cobbling together these mass-produced drums that happen to be around from marching bands, and stuff like that, or repurposing the saxophone, or repurposing the turntable and the microphone. You know, these kinds of things that where it was... Like, oh yeah, well, Reagan canceled music in schools. Well, let's make music with a record player. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and with a drum machine and a DX7 and so on. So, uh, so I'm always interested in how uh, grassroots, marginal uh, grassroots movements and marginal communities invent in response to the conditions that are thrust upon them. And, and I think that, we're, you know, as music becomes like water and as, you know, if we achieve universal broadband and uh, music as a service so that everybody can surf the entire archive all the time from anywhere, then what's, what will music become for us? How, who, will, who will be the next community to create a new repurposing of that technology to suit their very immediate community needs. Um, so I guess I'm kind of interested in those kinds of conversations. And, and in particular, like one thing that, cons that I do find to be a continued question is, is um, you know, we've talked about the future of the music world and the future of the music business. So, are either of those, so what is the future of the music business in terms of diversity, for example? Does the future of the music business reflect the future of the music communities that create the, you know, those, those products that become quote unquote monetized. Um, who's, who's making decisions that affect those communities? Those are questions that concern me. Um, does the future of music provide longevity for artists? Is there a way to be in this game for longer than a few years or a decade? Um, you know, what happens to a musician who's 50 and 60 and 70 years old? I mean, I know and work with a lot of such musicians they often are kind of forced to keep working until they die, you know, because they don't have really 
and infrastructure to support them. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say is, is socially filtered uh, media recapitulating, or is it as segregated as the communities we live in today? My sense is that actually they are, and I, I you know, one example is um, my friend Harry Allen, the media assassin of public enemy fame, uh, he has a great blog, Media Assassin, and uh, the day after the Video Music Awards, he found all the Twitter posts that included the word Kanye and the N-word, and there were lots of them. So that was kind of, you know, you know his conclusion was, well, actually, we're not post-racial. Racism is the future. <laughs> so can, what, what can we do to undo things like that? You know, we're all connected, so let's do something about it. Anyway. Thanks, Vijay. I think um, Gene Cook has been going through the Twitter feeds and I think it's pulling out some themes that people have been um, bringing up in some of the tweets uh, over the last couple of hours and she can go through theirs. I have a piece of good news for many folks. We just received word a few minutes ago that the legislation we've been working on to expand the low power radio service is going to be marked up in the House Commerce Committee uh, on Thursday. So that's <laughs> been 10 years in the making. Um, I also understand we've got other good news. I understand that uh, this group uh, figured out how to fix uh, the future music journalism. So while Gene's talking about some tweets, I want someone who is in the journalism discussion to explain how you guys have figured out the future. So some of the themes that we're seeing, um, a lot of them have to do with not sucking as a musician and also as a journalist. That is a theme that we've been seeing a lot of. There are a lot of quotes that people are kind of retweeting over and over again. Um, like from the metadata session this afternoon, if someone names his band various artists, they'll make a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> There's a comment, MP3 blogs are more, are more powerful than radio DJs. In other places they say, are MP3 blogs more powerful than radio DJs? My prediction, and this is the part where we recognize that this is a conference of geeks. And I'm a geek as well. My, my prediction is Spotify becomes the Harry Fox agency for digital licensing for everything, proprietary and opaque. I don't like the definition of indie music that at the journalist panels seems to be operating on. Five million unsigned bands don't all suck. Oh, and this must be from Sandy Perlman's. Every piece of intellectual property ever created by man can be stored for two to seven million. Two to seven million, either two to seven million dollars or eventually will be available on a, on a disc that's the size of your fingernail. I've heard him say that before. And then there are some questions. You know, is, is engagement of fans the new measure of success for a band versus sales? That's from Elliot Van Let's ask these guys. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? That's I, a good question. I, I feel like it is, you know, just because people aren't, or artists aren't making money really from record sales anymore. So um, I, f I feel like that, that's the biggest measure of su success is if you can sustain touring and, you know, keep building a community of fans, you know, you can have a career for the rest of your life. Uh, I live in a, a sort of slightly different universe because the jazz world is so specific and uh, the gatekeepers are the people who present at festivals and at performing arts centers and it's, I think it's sort of a different f maybe funding category or something but um, it tends to be more for me about having visibility among the power elite in the industry and fans then are brought to you through those kinds of events, like the festivals and so forth. And that's partly because, and I made this point somewhere else, there are very few places, there are very few jazz clubs, for example, in the United States. I mean, like a, a few hundred, and there are a few hundred million people in this country. So that actually makes it a little bit hard to connect with fans, except online, and of course, that is happening, so. I would say definitely record sales um, for, for my main group, Antibalas, have been, like, the, just to illustrate a point, uh, we did a tour in 2007. It was a two-month tour across um, North America and Canada um, supporting this album that we put out on Anti-Epitaph Records. So it, you know, it had proper distribution. It had press behind it. 
And um, at the end of the tour, our agent was like, I, you know, talking to our agent, talking to the people at Anti, looking over the figures of how many people were selling out shows, 700 to 1,500, you know, smaller cities, maybe two or 300. But they said, you know, a band that has an attendance record like yours should have sold at least five times, you know, 10 years ago, we would have projected your record sales to be five times as high as they actually are on paper now. So I think that's, you know, the yardstick of what successful is definitely has to be measured, you know, and those are just the financial things. I mean, successful is like, you know, like um, Vijay said, is does the band have longevity, you know, are they more than just, you know, something new for Pitchfork or whatever, you know, genre organ to write about and then move on to the next thing, you know, and um, so I think we need to expand, we definitely need to expand the uh, definition of successful. Uh, I was pondering the cloud versus infinite storage, and I didn't hear the question. So can you can you rephrase it quickly? <laughs> Is engagement of fans the new measure of success for a band versus sales? Uh, I find, uh, and I didn't hear. I actually didn't hear this talked about too much at the conference. But I find, a, um, in my career, I find a little bit of a disconnect between. Um, the people who are my Facebook and Twitter and MySpace people, whatever number that is, versus the, the number of people that are in the club that are coming to see me play. I and mean, I feel very fortunate to be able to go to uh, most cities in the United States and have anywhere at least 50 people always. I could probably go to 40 cities and get 50 people. And in some cities, I can go much farther above that. And that allows me to make a living. But I see it. Uh, I, I, those aren't the same people that are following me online. And I see this disconnect. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know um, that you can measure success by one, one number or the other. They still seem really fluid to me. Um, you know, I always had a problem with sound scan as a measure of success. Um, and I'm a little disturbed by the fact of now the numbers of followers online being used in the same way that SoundScan is being used. You're going to offer me a certain amount of money in the club based on my Twitter followers? <laughs> That's disturbing to me because I'm not sure they're the same. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure they're the same. I'm not sure the same people, you know, and I have no way of knowing. So, so I feel a disconnect there, and I, I would like to hear more people talk about that either from their experience or um, even a conceptual thing of where we're going with that. Yeah, just to chime in on that, I, um, my second group, Ocote Soul Sounds, uh, we were looking for representation this summer. We've done three al albums. They've had international releases. And this agent that I'm talking to, he looks on our MySpace page, and he's like, oh, you've only had, whatever, like 72,000 plays. Like, that's not very good. You know, I might have to reconsider. And I was like, dude, have you listened to our music? You know, th like, it, that was the first number that he went to. So it, it, it really kind of caught me off guard. It was strange. I'm like, what, you know, it, I think that people, you know, maybe the people that like us have more of a life. And they say, you know, like I think that's, that's, what, I think that's about, what I'm saying. You know? like, like, I wonder, yeah. yeah like, uh, Kristen, I think, has a really good question from Twitter. Before that, seriously, if you all aren't willing to raise your hands and talk about what you did at the breakouts, this is going to really fall apart. So, Kristen, why don't you do your question, and then please, we want to hear about the journalism breakout, we want to hear about the DMCA discussion, uh, Wayne Kramer's discussion. Please, we really hope that you all participate in this conversation. So, but go ahead and ask your question first. So, this came off the Twitter feed. They, um, they wanted to ask each artist what a musical turning point was in your lives. So, people might think about that for a second. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to rephrase it. What's the or biggest, we could talk about the DMCA. Biggest Who wants turning to talk about point the in your musical life. So, you know, something that was really resonating with your musical career. Uh, when I was uh, just starting out as a musician, I could name five artists that were heroes for me. Um, and I hesitate to say them because I don't, I don't want you to pick apart my music looking for them in it, but I'll just tell you who they were. Uh, Ani DeFranco, Michelle Schacht, the Indigo Girls, Soul Coughing, and Dave Matthews. Those were my five people. And when I finally met and played with the fifth, the last person on that list, that was a musical turning point for me because then I felt like all of a sudden I had on my feet under me and I could move on to other goals as an artist. And um, uh, I, I don't know, just that was a turning point for me. Stop looking at other people met all my heroes, uh, now I can move on. Um, a m musical turning point for me uh, was 
visiting and uh, spending a month in Cuba in 2006 and just seeing how, uh, along the lines of what Vijay was saying, people have a very, very different relationship with music. Um, it's very little of a product and very much about community, about meeting community needs, spiritual needs, and to fill in the gap you know, between what the structural problems of Cuba and just the, the goal of just being happy. And so in the absence of products and services, you know, there's always music. Um, the training was incredible, blew my mind. Um, you know, I think part of the reason for the embargo was that they let the Cuban musicians to the United States, they put us all out of business. <laughs> no joke. You know, middle school bands would blow most of us away. Embarrassing. Um, and, uh, you know, so that, that really blew my mind. You know, I, I went there, I, I can't have any romantic expectations, and then I walked to the corner, and Eliades Ochoa from Venezuela Social Club is filling up his gas tank and buying some rum. And I'm like, hey! Que vola? Yeah, so um, that, that blew my mind. And United States, you know, I'm really looking forward to relations with Cuba changing because both countries really stand a lot to uh, benefit from an open dialogue and, um, just in general, uh, you know, being able to travel has, is always a musical turning point because reflect on what's good about the states and what's really absent. So it's always turning. Yeah, I'd echo a lot of what Martin just said. Um, a lot of my, I mean, well, are we talking, uh, here's the question again, are we talking about turning points in our musical lives or our musical careers? Because those are pretty different things, I'd say. Um, I mean. You know, I remember a turning point when I first just started whacking on my sister's piano when I was five. And I remember that day, you know, that was a turning point. I also remember, um, you know, in 97, I traveled to Senegal with Steve Coleman and we played with some Sabar drummers. And then they took us to one of their local gigs where they did their thing. And that blew my mind. I also remember times when I lived in California and I'd go to see Carnatic music, uh, South Indian classical music concerts in the Sil in Silicon Valley, where it'd be a room full of, you know, 750 South Indians in the middle of California listening to music. And suddenly, it was it felt like I'd been teleported to to Madras or something, you know, um, where music and community suddenly kind of become one thing. Uh, those kinds of experiences are turning points for me. You know, in terms of career turning points, um, a year after I moved to New York, there was a, a Gary Giddens, who's a very well-known jazz critic, wrote a feature on me in the Village Voice, and that sort of got the ball rolling for me in terms of suddenly being someone that people knew about or paid attention to or something. So that there, there are always those sorts of moments, um, you know, or I've been also had privileges to play with some of my musical heroes like you have. Um, so, you know, I guess it's a similar story. I guess uh, my, my turning point in my musical life um, would be when I first started writing my own songs, I guess when I was 20, um, I, I've been playing guitar and singing since I was 12, and I've, I was always in somebody else's band. And, um, you know, through college, I listened to a lot of Big Star and a lot of Uncle Tupelo, and so that's how I learned to write songs and it was kind of in a country way. And I was like, okay, the, you know, I could put a genre on this, so this is what I do, I'm an alt country artist. And, but I always wrote these songs that, um, playing them out in public, I called them my weird songs. And so I never played them out in public because in, in my head I would hear them with an orchestra or all these arrangements, almost like a soundtrack. But um, I didn't know what to name it and so I, uh, became close with um, this guy from an indie band in North Carolina called the Virginia Reel. And I, I played them for him and I'm like, yeah, these are my weird songs. And he's like, dude, your weird songs are awesome. You should do that because what you do now is boring. <laughs> and, uh, so um, I listened to him and I uh, got a four track and I, you know, I can't play anything other than guitar very well. So I just started singing all of the arrangement ideas that I had. and. Uh, you know, passed out the tape and all of a sudden I had a style and then people were telling me, have you ever heard of Scott Walker, or, you know, this, and I, I hadn't and I figured, I, I just, it taught me to learn to uh, trust my instincts, you know, not being a schooled musician or, you know, having much of a, a classical background, but just more to 
trust that what's in my head isn't weird. You know. We have um, a question and a comment from the audience. Yeah. Well, I mean, since you mentioned the journalism, is are there other people that were here from the journalism session? Um, good, because I can't recap it entirely, but. Um, I, my name is Sarah Donnelly. I'm actually a funder more than anything, I guess, with um, foundations. And I've come to a few of these summits now, and I have great admiration for what this forum accomplishes because you try to do so much by, um, you know, I, I'm more of a jazz person, so I'm going to turn, um, I, I'm curious to see what Vijay could comment on. Um, and I'll connect it to the journalism session. And I was curious with Josh from NPR yesterday because I'm always interested to see how jazz um, um, can fit into this dialogue because you, again, I think you um, positively accomplish so many things in, um, um, in a very selfless way. I'm very um, impressed with the fact that so many people come to this gathering because they want this conversation so much. And you're not asking to be paid to be here. And um, you're not so completely concerned about gigs here. It is about art for social change. And it is about business. And it is about technology. And it is about infrastructure. And this um, genre of indie rock is incredibly successful to me. And it's not about financial reward. I'm very impressed with this community. Um, I'm older than a lot of these people here, and I'm um, very concerned about how other genre like jazz can thrive, and um, and in a sense, the new music and classical music field as well. So let me let me just connect this to the journalism session, since that's what you asked me to do, Michael. Um, I think I'm I am curious to know again. Um, I listened to those journalists, Tom Moon and Howard Mandel, talk about the fact that value an aesthetic in their writing has always been at such a high premium and the idea of commodifying the writing um, doesn't even seem to really um, cross their paths because there, again, there's never been any kind of compensation attached to it. And the fan base has demanded um, the context that was asked for in that session. I mean, the fan base in jazz has always wanted a lot of context and um, um, I, I, I guess, um, hmm, Vijay, can, do you mind? I'm just so impressed with the fact that FMC brought you and Josh and previously other jazz artists, and I'd just like to kind of push you more into the conversation. Not to say that indie rock is all in any way one thing, but there's a mobility in that field that I've never felt in the jazz field, and I'm, I'm just trying to define why that is, and I'd like your commentary. Thanks, sorry about the longness of that. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I, I, um, you know, I only just bounced through the journalism panel for a, a minute, so I didn't really fully um, grasp its ethos. But, uh, but I would say that there's been actually a lot of soul searching in the jazz community lately, as, or at least the jazz blogosphere. And yes, that does exist, there is one. Um, Especially, it's kind of exploded of late for, for whatever reason. Um, and, you know, there's been this thing about jazz not being cool, for example. And why aren't we cool? Look at this clip from this Will Ferrell movie where they made jazz look not cool, you know, for example. And I'm like, well, that's... What about this? And then I, you know, I had to say, well, what about this clip from David Letterman when he called Esperanza Spalding the coolest person who's ever been on the show? Okay, that's a counterexample. Um, so I, I think one of the problems, I mean, I mentioned, so I was recently asked to debate Terry Teachout, who's a, uh, he's actually a drama critic for the Wall Street Journal, but he recently wrote this um, kind of controversial article about jazz uh, based on some recent NEA findings, which, was, which seemed to indicate that people who go to jazz concerts are getting older. And they're also getting uh, fewer, sparser. Um, what, but what that, um, so he was saying that, well, this is because there's a problem with jazz. Jazz musicians don't know how to reach young people. And uh, I guess, you know, the jazz blogosphere kind of responded with hysteria. Because, well, what about this gig that I played last week where, you know, there were 150 people who paid $10 to see me and, uh, 
So, and they, they were all under 30, so, you know, F you, uh, whatever. And, uh, or whatever, you know, people were kind of taking little anecdotes to try to fight statistics. And that's a problem because that, you know, that's, it reminded me of in 2004, people in blue states who didn't know anybody who would vote for Bush, so they couldn't imagine losing the election. <laughs> uh, but the fact is, you know, what that NEA study pointed out, if, I mean, that was his take on it was, well, jazz is kind of disconnected or something from the populace. My take on it was actually, the reason that fewer people went to jazz concerts was because there were fewer jazz concerts to go to across the United States. And so part of the problem is not accessibility of the music, but access to the music. You can't find it in most cities. You know, it's, there's nowhere to play, um, and there's no radio station that broadcasts it in most places that you go across the United States. NPR, I mean, one of the things that I think they kind of brought to the table yesterday is that they're really trying to change that, you know, and that's a great thing. And, you know, once again, they for example, I seem to be in their good graces for the moment, so I'm happy about that. Um, you know, but it, there, it's, a, it's a broader problem about wh why does jazz have no infrastructure that can reach people across the United States? Why is it concentrated to the coastal cities, the blue states, and so on? So, um, and that's a, that's, that's a pretty deep question about America, which I can't answer, but I think we could all think about. Well, t talk a little bit more for a minute, BJ, about what you mean by infrastructure. I mean, you're talking about clubs, and you're talking about, like, record stores, are you talking about... I mean, there's also the digital infrastructure out there. Are you talking about yeah. those things? So one thing that also kind of came out in the NEA survey was that actually more people, I mean, this will come as no surprise, obviously more people today access music online. And it seems actually that for, for a lot of people that seems to be as good or at least you know, a, a workable substitute right now for going to see live music. And of course, this survey was done in a recession year, so that may have affected the results, because it's a lot easier to watch YouTube than to pay $35 to go see Joe Schmo at the Village Vanguard or something like that. Um, but I guess what I'm talking about when I say infrastructure, well, I think you know the comparison was made, for example, to classical music. Now, classical music has an infrastructure. I mean, there's really nobody here talking about classical music that I, if you're here, raise your hand. I don't think I ran across you. Oh, okay, I missed your panel. Um, uh, <laughs> but um, they have infrastructure. I mean, they have public funding that goes to symphonies, and they also have music schools across the country. There's a belief that, you know, you should, you know, it's okay to take music lessons and study the classics and there are also, you know, churches support classical music across the country. So there's basically a, I mean, it's not that it's a huge market, but it's a robust market. I mean, it's, it's not as fragile as the jazz market. When a recession hits, the jazz market suffers really badly because there's no one, it's all very, it's like an aggregate of microscopic economies. So there's, there's, no, there's no kind of overarching system in place, there's no network, there's no, very little that kind of keeps it going. And, and you know, one thing we saw in the last couple of years is the coming and going and, uh, well, uh, a few major organizations folded and then suddenly found a 11th hour donor and, uh, you know, like the jazz, New York Jazz Festival and the Newport Jazz Festival lost their JVC sponsorship and so then they were almost canceled and blah, blah, blah. Jazz Times, the major industry magazine, folded and then was bought by somebody else. And uh, the major jazz industry um, uh, conference, which is the, uh, what was it called, uh, IAJE, vanished. It doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> so all these, you know, to me, when it's, when it's at that point where things kind of get annihilated and created and annihilated again, it's sort of at that marginal, uh, point where it could kind of disappear at any moment. And that's what I feel is the problem with our corner of the industry. So um, 
I feel like at this moment, because we're so much more networked, we could be working together to sort of fix these problems at a wider scale. So. We have a um, comment down here, a question from Anna Chalenta with Georgetown University. Before I turn the mic over to Anna, can I just ask everybody to express your appreciation and give a round of applause for Georgetown, the students, the staff, Anna, the faculty here. <laughs> Okay, I don't think I want to give you the mic after all. Yeah, now that I'm embarrassed. Um, I just wanted to, to add a comment, being the faculty member that I am, about education. Um, and I think music, and we can talk about jazz or classical music or, or anything like that. Um, and first of all, I should give credit to uh, Jennifer. This was an, in conversation with someone um, today at the session was, yeah, if, if, why do they keep cutting music from the schools? That sends a message that it's not important. And so this is true. When music is in the schools, though, it's treated differently from all the other art forms. Students learn to write poetry and short stories, but they also read great works of poetry and short stories. They, learn, they, they are exposed to um, amazing works of visual art in addition to doing their own art projects. But for some reason, schools often have the idea that, well, music is only an activity, so, and it's expensive. So they'll, they'll, they'll cut the music program, but you know, there are music programs that don't require a lot of money. And the, the, the problem, I think, a lot of times is if there is a music program, a lot of times it's not about teaching students or even listening with students to music. It's about, well, only the music they themselves can play. So let's all get up and we'll sing a song and now we're done with music. It, so the activity of music is incredibly important. But I think um, too many schools and too many educators are leaving music to, well, the students have their iPods. They'll, they'll figure it out on their own. And, and, and a lot of times, it, it's great just to sit down and listen to a piece of music with someone and go, man, that was amazing. And did you hear that? Did you hear that? And, and if music could just, just music listening could be used in the classroom more, just as a dis starting discussion, I think it might help us get some of these younger audiences. I think we're seeing the effects of cutting uh, these sort of appreciative music programs, no matter what the genre is from schools. I think and if that, you have any comments. <laughs> I think that that actually, um, goes in line with some of the earlier, uh, there was another question from the Twitter feed that was talking about why are music arts not valued more highly in the United States? And what is it about our history that undervalues artists? Which is something that we were talking a little bit about before the panel. <laughs> uh, I'd like to respond to that. Part, part of it, uh, like Vijay was saying, there's the music world and the music business. And it's the same thing with education. There's all these educators trying to figure out you know, and study ways that young people cognitively develop in healthy ways and socialize well. And then there's the people who are making the policy decisions who are usually like, I live in Austin, it's, it's a Republican appointee who's not elected, not accountable to the people and is a business person. So they're just looking at how many kids pass the eighth grade reading test and how many jails are we gonna need to build in 10 years. And that's their approach to educational management. Um, so music, uh, th they just don't get it. And I think most of us, or all of us know that kids who have access to music, who engage in it, and not just engage by downloading, but engage in terms of thinking it, practicing it, sharing it with their friends, engaging in a community setting, have better lives. And um, you know, it's, it's just a question of how short are we gonna sell ourselves as a country? And you know, when are we gonna start moving our resources from these cannibalistic industries to ones that nurture us, you know, so it's, it's part of a larger discussion. Great, Thank you, Santa, please. We have a follow-up comment from the audience. Just... I, think... I, I, just, ahead, I just want to jump in really quick and add something that came up. We, we had a session today, um, a reunion of uh, artists that have gone on the FMC, ATC, uh, uh, New Orleans artist retreats. We had lunch together today, and this, this came up, um, and I just want to throw this out really quickly. Um, to connect it to some other themes that are happening here at the conference, which is we talked about today, um, that music education also has, um, I, I think, a direct impact on the, the piracy, file sharing, copying situation. And just to state that clearly, which is if, if you teach someone to play an instrument, they think about music differently, they value it differently, maybe they're less likely to steal it, maybe less likely to think about that this music is just this thing that shows up on their iPod, but they're the, here, they make music, and here we are in music education, we can perhaps connect those two experiences through listening together, through bringing instruments into uh, kids' lives at an early age. 
I'm gonna have to put a short anecdote. When I was seven, I used to hop the fence and throw my neighbor's tomatoes against the wall of their house. <laughs> and I've started organic gardening in the past couple of years. And knowing the work that it goes into raising tomatoes, I, if I caught myself, I would have beat the shit out of myself, you know? So I definitely, you know, the process of doing it, definitely in my life of gardening has given me the utmost respect for what's, what's created. And now I would never dare steal or destroy something out of someone's garden. So, you know, I agree with you 100%. Yeah. I was going to say to your comment about music education, I think one of the other things is to be able to understand and use it as a part of a form of integrated curriculum. Because when you talk about music education, if you use music composition and how it applies to math or songwriting applies to language arts or you could use music and how it applies to history and then if you put dance with music, you can have kinesthetics and then it becomes integrated curriculum and then it may be a different way to approach how to get music education within the schools. I was the dork who was sitting at lunch talking about this with Anna. Um, I do actually have a question and follow up to that because this is all stuff that came up. Erin, exactly what you were saying was what we were talking about, which is, you know, what lesson are you sitting out there or sending out when you're saying, we don't really care about the arts. It's not important, so we're going to cut it out. So how can we expect people going forward to think that there's any value in it? But with that being said, and I don't mean to put you guys in the spot. I'm just asking you because you happen to be up there. Um, are you doing anything with music legislation in terms of education? Not, not the after, I mean the after school stuff is awesome because we need that too, but in terms of bringing music and arts back into the school, are you guys as artists doing anything in terms of getting involved sort of in an advocacy level, like actually in the education system, like within the whatever it is, eight hour work to, or a school day that kids have? Sorry, I didn't mean to be like, guys. <laughs> No, the short answer for me is no, but I do, um, you know, for me, my avenues are, I work with um, two rock and roll girls camps, one in Brooklyn and one in Western Mass, and, um, you know, making sure that girls know that they can play music as well as boys. Uh, my, my, my answer is within that eight hour day is no as well, but, um, what we're trying to do in Asbury Park is to get a music mentorship program because one of the best um, after school programs they have in town is the football team, Asbury Park football. And uh, for the people that aren't athletic, you know, they have really nothing to do except for, you know, there's a lot of trouble to get into in Asbury Park. Um, so we're trying to get together with a lot of, uh, there, there's a great community of local musicians, um, some, some young, some older, and uh, put together you know, a semester program for 10 to 15 students to um, introduce them to all types of music, rock music, hip hop, you know, if they want to learn hip hop, we'll also introduce them to poetry and how to write lyrics through learning about poetry. And um, so, but as far as the eight hour school day, not yet. To answer your question, yes, but not directly as far as the legislation. Um, I don't know if you're here, but I just ran through this pro project that I'm working on that's sort of a complementary arts network to what's going on in high school. So there would be curriculum and different lesson plans that teachers in high schools can access to say, okay, I want you to pick a concert this weekend that has to do with what we're studying. You know, maybe a Tejano music, for instance, or go check out the Texas Accordion Festival. You go there with your passport, you, get in, you ride the bus there for free, you get in for free, and then blog about it, and that blog is your homework. So not so much as far as getting it in to the everyday, um, because for instance, Texas is, the teachers are totally bogged down by standardized testing. Um, but creating other tools that they can use to sort of uh, embellish what they're doing in the classroom and, and have, have the students engaged in learning outside the classroom, because I think there's a big rift between learning and education. And most, you know, we know, all know most schools, by the end of it, you're really tired of learning. And a lot of kids just shut down and their minds shut down. So, is trying to cultivate them as lifelong learners and understand that you know most, if not all, learning comes actually outside of school. So. Uh, my name is Joy. I'm from Pittsburgh, and I direct Project 53 Music Resource Center, and we just opened up a couple months ago. And right now, we have free instruments and a free instrument library for people, and of all ages, I focus on the children. 
but other people work with people of all ages and provide free practice space and free lessons. Um, my questions would be, uh, what other groups out there exist like that? Because I wasn't able to find any uh, when I was just starting up and my networking skills are um, on purpose, uh, not very good. Um, <laughs> I, I also run a club, so uh, three nights a week I'm very busy networking. So when it comes to music, I just like to play and to share. Um, so my questions are what other groups are out there that are not school related that can provide some free music to the future? And uh, maybe how can we network together? Because I liked some of the examples that y'all were throwing out. And how can we network together so maybe kids could get online and find out that this uh, place is right down the street where they can go try out a trombone or an accordion for free. Why don't we do this? Why don't you give us your email address? Gene, could we have him just say his email address real quick? Gene? Yeah. What? Oh, no. I was going to have him do it over the mic, but that's OK. Does your organization have a website? Or a website, yeah. Uh, yes. It's called Project 53, Musician Resource Center. Uh, right now, we only have a MySpace, uh, .com backslash Project 53 PGH, PGH as in Pittsburgh. And uh, you can email me directly, I'm Joy Tujours, at project.53 at hotmail.com. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, my name is Brian McTeer. I'm, a, I'm 36. I'm a musician uh, and a recording studio owner. And I've produced a lot of records in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, this is a kind of a funny story, and to get back to the you know music education idea conversation, uh, last year I was asked to speak at Career Day at my high school, because what I do is so cool, and you know, uh, naturally I, I expected a sold out audience for each one of my classes because I rarely get sold out audiences otherwise, um, and uh, and anyway through the conversation as as it went along. Uh, I realized, in fact, actually, it really took a, a teacher that they had sort of stationed in the back room so the kids didn't uh, totally mutiny on us. Um, the teacher pointed out to me that uh, everything I was saying, everything I was saying about what I do, they had no idea what I was talking about. That it just was gone over their heads. They had no concept. Um, I finally uh, narrowed it down to um, kids' understanding of what an album of music is. And they don't fucking know. <laughs> they don't know. They don't know what an album is. Um, I asked, how many kids here have a favorite song? And in the, the room, all 20 kids' hands went up. I said, OK, how many of you guys have a favorite band? And only about eight or nine kids raised their hand. And then I said, how many of you guys have a favorite album by your favorite band? And nobody's hands went up, <coughs> not a single kid. Um, and they, you know, they looked cool. They had, the, they had the whole thing down. But everything that they had going didn't, didn't seem to really revolve around anything but the absolute surface of it all. So my, my point is, you know, in talking about music education, you know, would there be value to teaching these kids, uh, just like other art appreciation classes, you know, teaching them about Sgt. Pepper and the White Album and teaching them about real albums and actual, you know, really important monumental marks in the history of popular music. Because this is, this is really the most, uh, the most <coughs> powerful cultural influence, artistically, that we, that we really have. So who, who can answer that? <laughs> well, if you want to get into canon building, um, I think it should be a shared effort, something that we should build collectively online, perhaps on Wikipedia or something like that, um, because it, there's always this danger of it kind of existing only in one area of music, for example, or you know, not really uh, cutting across as wide a swath of the history of the music as we can. On that note, um, every once in a while, there's something that does really shine a light on an album. And, and um, this past summer, my group, Antibalas, were part of a, a collaboration with Public Enemy and The Roots, where we played the entire It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back album live with two drummers, two guitars, six horns, 
uh, Flavor Flav, uh, Chuck D, Professor Good, the whole, ev everybody. And so we actually performed the entire album live back to front. And um, it would be more exciting to see, you know, if, if, if these albums, you know, in, in various canons, um, to, you know, have concerts where the entire album is played, you know? Uh, maybe in the same way, maybe in different ways, but that would be definitely one way. And I think people are looking for new concert experiences. So to see classic albums played, you know, by the same members or new members or in a totally different style. Um, another really interesting project, um, of, uh, one of my colleagues in Antibalas produced an album called The Dub Side of the Moon, which sounds like a really crazy novelty, but it was a dub version of um, Dark Side of the Moon. And I, I kind of, for whatever reason, wrote off Pink Floyd and became to really like them, and especially that album after <laughs> Dove Side know. of the Moon, because it, it brought the song. I'm like, these are such great songs. And even it, like in reggae style, it's done really well. This is a great album. So I think there's different projects out there, but it's definitely not, you know, more people need to consider those, those mediums, whether it's concerts or redoing entire albums. Okay, we have time for one last short comment or question, and then we're going to wrap it up. Wait, I'm sorry, the mic's in the back. Um, I'm a, I'm a singer, I'm from Richmond, Virginia, I have my own band, and to tie in with the music education thing, um, my violinist in my band is an orchestra teacher, and I know that music teachers all over the place, especially in public schools, are strapped. I mean, they're strapped, they have more students, they have less budget to work with, their classes are in danger of getting cut. Um, as musicians, I think we have a really good opportunity to go in and help them, and they're gonna be a lot more re receptive. I've been into his classes and taught about songwriting, taught about the music business. I'm going in next week and talk about the stuff we're talking about here. Um, and as a result, we're now doing an annual benefit concert with the entire orchestra, teach the kids about. Um, and it's stuff that he wants to teach his kids, but he just doesn't have the time, he doesn't have the budget. Um, so if you're a musician and you want to volunteer even a few hours, I think there's a lot of music teachers now that would be open to that because of, because of all the budget cuts. And that's a way we can, we can impact kids. And, you know, you never know what comes out of that. You know, it's something that we can do when we tour, too, as artists, and that I often have the privilege of doing um, the day of the show. When you get to town, they drive you not to the hotel, but to the high school. And you go do a workshop or something. And uh, just connect with people and show them an example of what this life is like and what we do and why we do it and that sort of thing. I mean, I can remember, I still remember seeing Garth Fagan's dance company when I was six in elementary school. I mean, that made such an impression on me. Like, wow, you can do this as you know like I didn't I didn't know that, that was even an option you know so uh, just stuff like that that it make it, it makes these indelible imprints on people when not so it doesn't have to be just about you know what's in your vicinity and making it into a kind of um, job but it can kind of be this joy that comes along with touring and reaching people around the country and I think with that we're going to wrap things up. I want to thank the panel very much for staying with us this afternoon. We, um, we spent uh, over a year putting together this conference, and we couldn't have done it um, without the incredible Future Music staff, many of you whom you've met this week. They're out in the hallways. We have a um, really remarkable um, number of volunteers and others who helped us throughout the year and, and helped uh, implement this thing and make sure people knew where the Levy Center was and, and all that. And uh, we really couldn't do it without them. Uh, we want to thank our board, we want to thank our advisory board, our community of friends who really helped design this conference with us. Um, I really do want to encourage you, we have paper um, evaluations, but you're also going to get an email in a couple weeks, so you can do it online if you want to be more green. I hear that's the trendy thing. Um, but we, we really do appreciate your feedback, we take it very seriously. Um, I want to thank Georgetown, as again, um, we really need to thank our sponsors, we want to thank our sponsors, because um, as you can imagine, in this conference, you know, we're a very small nonprofit. this conference takes a lot of staff time, a lot of uh, hard costs, and without the sponsors, we simply can't do it. So hopefully people feel like it's valuable, and, and hopefully, you know, you all can keep supporting it, and we'll have more support in the future. And I think with that, what have I forgotten? What, they, they don't need to be thanked again, do they? <laughs> no, they clap for them. Okay, well, thank the artists again. <laughs>
Thank you so much. We'll see you at the cocktail party at 18th Street Lounge, which will begin at 6.30. Thanks.